are uh, about to start our next section, which is on financing. We again have a panel to support us on financing. Uh, as you're considering financing, financing your organization will essentially come from uh, a, a combination of three sources. One source is going to be a, a member subscriber kind of source. Another source is going to be from events or activities that you host that's kind of a one-time payment for that event or that activity, like a conference. Um, and then there'll be donations and getting donations from a variety of sources. Uh, our speaker is going to be talking about these and, and different combinations of doing those. Uh, our first speaker is Tracy from the Homeschool Foundation, so I'll let Tracy come on up and get started. Thank you. Um, get this so it'll play. Okay. All right. Quick question for you, engineering types. Okay. I'm not seeing my little arrow to hit the play, so it enlarges it. And so it was up here before. Do I have to? I don't think I have to be connected to the internet. To no, do you it. don't have to be connected to the internet. Um, under slideshow. Slideshow. Okay, this is a new uh, slideshow, and then from start. From the start. Okay, and I and then I can switch it out myself. Okay, apologize for that. I'm just a homeschool mom, so I'm a little technologically challenged at times. Um, so, I wanted to start. Um, there we go. Okay, I wanted to start just by um, acknowledging that you all have a variety of situations your organization your group a lot of you are small i was talking to um, Anna yesterday um, from columbia and her group started just uh, sort of organically the group of moms uh, coming together and it's grown and grown and now she's looking for um, an opportunity to you know not just monetize that but to have a greater impact and so if you're in the situation where you uh, are a small organization just remember this uh, little saying here I think it kind of applies to a lot of us uh, so yeah if you think you're too small try spending the night in a closed room with a mosquito so a lot of you are mosquitoes <laughs> and you can do a lot of good um, even though you're small before I get into uh, what I do with the Homeschool Foundation and my role as Director of Development, I just thought I'd share for just a minute a little bit about my story. Some, some of you recognize the name Klicka. Uh, my late husband, Chris, worked for the Homeschool Legal Defense Association for over 24 years. Um, it was the only job he ever had coming out of, fresh out of law school. We had just gotten married and uh, he had a passion for constitutional law, for parental freedom, for, um, for conservative Christian values. And so as we had children and, and started homeschooling them, we, we just knew that we were on the right track. It was the best decision we ever made. And I was a stay-at-home mom for 23 years. But my, one of the, my favorite things to do while he was working at HSLDA was to travel with him internationally when he would speak and connect with other homeschoolers from around the world. And he would always want me to go with him when he traveled internationally. So through those years of being a stay-at-home mom but occasionally getting to travel, I developed a love for many of you around the world who um, we share that same vision and passion for raising our children and encouraging other parents to raise their children um, and give them the very best. And so uh, after my husband passed away in 2009, um, a couple years after that, I started working for the Homeschool Foundation. And one of the things I love about the foundation, I'll give a short little presentation in a couple days. Um, it's just a little uh, sponsor moment give you more but one of the things I love about what we do is we help families um, who are in all in financial crisis or experience loss and and so being a widow myself a young widow uh, with five children at home for a season really gave me a, a greater compassion for the widows that we help and other families so that's a little bit about my story um, and what I do with the homeschool foundation I want to move on to talking about um, why people give briefly and then 
what, how you can leverage that for your organization based on what your vision and your goals are. And so people give, um, a, a big one you hear is they want to change or save a life. Uh, people give because they want to create or promote or preserve a foundational value such as parents have the right to direct the education of their children. They give because they want to build a sense of community and we're seeing that more and more with younger uh, millennials and Gen X. Uh, that sense of community is really important. People give because they want to give back to society. Um, the power of gratitude for mentors and others who have invested in their lives can be a strong factor of why they want to give back. And when I say give, I don't just mean give monetarily, so don't uh, underestimate the value of giving time and, uh, and, and hard labor, your volunteers in that. Um, people also give because they want to memorialize a loved one, they want to leave a legacy. And then people also give, or groups give, because it's mutually beneficial. And you, we have sponsors here, so um, there's possibility with other like-minded organizations, you'll find sponsors or investors that want to partner with you in your mission. And bottom line is people give because they're asked. Um, if you don't ask, people won't give. So that's, that is uh, essential, but, but at the very root is all giving involves an emotional response on the part of those who give. And this, I like this Nigerian saying, it is the heart that does the giving, the fingers only let go. And so your job in whatever you do is to communicate the heart of your, of your mission to those you want to partner with you and to support you. And yes, you can provide statistics and facts, and that's all important, that validates what you do, but giving is really an emotional connection, emotional response um, to, your, to your vision and your mission. Now, your vision, you, we talked a lot yesterday about vision, but your vision is going to determine the goals that you have for your organization or your group. And based on those goals um, is going to determine what type of organization that you form and what you do with that organization. So I just want to talk for just a couple minutes about three different types of organizations since, since they are all probably represented here. Um, I think it's important for you to know your goals and then let that decide what kind of organization that you should have. As like I was talking to Ana yesterday, um, they're a local, they're kind of an organic group. They provide local, maybe growing regional support to homeschooling moms, so it could be a mom's group. You could have a homeschooling co-op where you're just um, a lot of families that all want to come together to support one another in homeschooling. You could be an umbrella school, and I heard that talked about yesterday. There's a lot of umbrella schools that are forming in different countries, and so that's one type of group uh, that you could have or ha maybe have formed. And that's not to say that it can't become something else, but start with where you're at. The next type of group that you could have is a legislative um, grassroots activist group. And the primary purpose for that group is advocacy and education. Not that you can't do that in a local um, support kind of group, but it takes on a bigger role at this level. Um, and so it can be a local, it can be a regional, it can be a national group. And one of your primary goals is going to be to work for good legislation or stopping bad legislation in your country or in your um, provincial area, depending on how you have it set up. And simultaneously with that, you're gonna always wanna be educating the homeschooling community as well as those who you are trying to uh, work with, your legislators and representatives. Um, that's all part of that. And then the third kind of a group, which is what we are, the Homeschool Foundation, is a nonprofit. We are a um, nationwide organization, and that kind of a group is if you want to have a broad-based um, form of support to the homeschooling community, which can include education and advocacy also. It can also include legal defense, depending on how your organization is set up, but it also includes charitable initiatives, um, 
partnering or helping others uh, financially. And that's what we do at the Homeschool Foundation. So I wanna go back very briefly to those three groups and talk about fundraising now um, based on the type of group that you have. So if you have a local or regional support group um, that's primarily there to provide support to your community, um, as Ray mentioned, um, one of the ways of funding is to do events and, and they don't have to be super big events. They can be small events, meetings, retreats, uh, opportunities for homeschooling families to come together to meet one another, to sort of network. Um, you can do many fundraisers. If you're homeschooling, you have children who create and who um, you know, make things that might be uh, something you could sell at something like a, a fundraiser of some type. Um, another thing you can do is to have contests. Um, in, in the US, uh, that happens quite frequently. Um, homeschooling families, because they're not in the traditional school system, are looking for opportunities where their children can sort of uh, grow and have an opportunity to demonstrate what they're learning. And so contests are good for that, but they're also a, an opportunity to raise money for your organization. Because when you host the contest, then there's usually an entrance fee and people are willing to pay that. And then there's judging and winners and prizes. And prizes can come from donations from, uh, from businesses and that that see the value of your organization and contribute. And then I just want to talk, and Ray also talked about membership. So that's another thing that you can do is, is charge a small membership fee. It, it just really depends on how big your group is, whether you could support that kind of thing. Um, but then the last thing I want to talk really quickly about is a homeschool foundation. Uh, one of the ways that we partner with groups in the US, but also internationally, is through providing a group grant to um, small groups that have 25 or more members and that meet the qualifications of a group as far as what types of activities and things you are doing. Um, we don't give group grants to like legislative uh, grassroots activist groups, but we do give group grants to homeschooling families coming together to form a group um, that maybe are like a co-op or want to uh, have a you know robotics competition or a, a fine arts fair or things like that. So if there's uh, an interest in that and that's the type of group you have, please feel free to come and talk to me and I can give you more information about that. Okay, moving on quickly because of the time. Um, the next group, the legislative uh, activist group, which is primarily for advocacy um, a policy and education. Uh, you can make that a membership group, um, like HSLDA is that type of group because we provide legal defense to families. But beyond that, you can also partner with other businesses to provide perks or discounts to those members that they would not get otherwise um, by, by uh, joining your organization. You can partner with other like-minded organizations, and HSLDA has done that as well because we work together. We support other organizations financially, internationally, um, and we also get support from other organizations as we work together on various uh, legislative uh, initiatives. And then you can also uh, look for sponsors, like this event has sponsors, or affiliates where you promote their um, products and that and then donors who support your mission. The big thing with this type of group is that there usually isn't tax deductibility for donations. So then the final one is the nonprofit. And if you are truly wanting to be a nonprofit organization, you are going to have to develop a comprehensive, coordinated fundraising campaign that's going to involve many different avenues. And uh, the primary one is building your donor base, finding donor prospects, and building those relations, um, but can include also seeking grants. Um, there are a lot of money, there's a lot of money to be had from grants. It's a, it's a kind of a challenging process to write grants, but it's not impossible. And there's a lot of helps out there for that. 
Um, advertising, marketing, there's things that you can do. One of the things that, that we partner with organizations, they, they send out an e-blast, which is a dedicated email talking about our mission and giving people an opportunity to connect with us. And we promote, uh, we feature their um, publication in exchange. It's a barter relationship. The nice thing about nonprofits usually is it's there is tax deduction for gifts. And so people are more inclined to give in those circumstances. Okay, and just the last minute here, I just want to give, um, if that's okay, just uh, some tips for whatever kind of organization you have. So f to start with, you need to have a short, concise mission statement. If you look at our mission statement, it's very short, it's very broad, it's not too specific, it gives us a lot of freedom to, uh, to do different things. It doesn't limit us, but it's also clear enough that others can understand. The next thing you need to do is you need to clearly communicate your value proposition. What that is, is that tells people what they will get by partnering with you, by supporting you. So this is our value proposition. We have several we use in different settings, but y this is one that's right clearly posted on our donation page for our site so people know exactly what they're getting when they give to our organization. The next um, tip is because all giving is an emotional response to your mission, um, it is important to use the power of story when you communicate your mission to others. And that story can be a story of how you started, of what you're doing, but can definitely include people's whose lives you are touching because of what you are doing. Share the stories with them of, uh, if you are interacting with representatives, share the stories, let people see what you're doing in a very personal way. It personalizes your mission. Um, it also engages people on that heart or emotional level. They're more likely to connect to you. There's too many opportunities to give. There's, there's thousands and thousands and thousands. Why? should they give to you. So that's where the power of story comes in. It also demonstrates um, ROI, return on investment. People, if you share the stories, that's the clearest way for people to see um, what they're getting by giving or partnering with you. And then it leads to greater engagement and relationship and your best support is going to come when you build personal relationships with the people that support what you are doing. Um, building a community, as I said earlier, is important. Um, use the power of social media to build community, network with other like-minded individuals and groups. Um, use volunteers, um, provide service opportunities for people to partner with you, because not everybody can give. And then make sure that you report back to your volunteers and supporters. Um, the collective achievements, I say collective because it's never just about you. You could not do what you do without all of you and your supporters working together. So it's, it's telling them what they um, have achieved and letting them know. And then finally, make sure that you thank your donors and your volunteers. Do it often, make it as personal as you can. Um, use your stories to communicate return on investment <clears throat> and then invite them to continue partnering with you and maybe partnering in a, in a greater way. Um, just one last point is just the thought um, is that money isn't everything. It's a means to an end. God has unlimited resources and uh, with his blessing, he will provide what you need. But a man with money is no match for a man with a vision on a mission. So that's all I have. Thank you very much. Okay, we're going to hold all questions till the end because we got started just a few minutes late. Uh, and so that way, if you have questions, they can continue on into the lunch hour. And next, I'm going to ask Alberto from Mexico. Thank you. Morning. I, I told Tracy that if she will mention something that I had before, that would just say, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> so I agree with everything that you had said. And uh, well, my uh, 
presentation is going to be a little bit different. Um, I've, I've been in business for about 30 years, and I have started probably seven companies. I have uh, had uh, some of them very successful, and some of them were not, and some of them I had to, to sell. I have uh, good stories about uh, good partnering, and I have bad stories about partnering. I have good stories about products, and I have bad stories about products. But everything that uh, we have done, and I have done, is, is precisely thinking about customers. And uh, we may think that we are not in business, but we are all in business. And we think that we are not in business, then, then we are not alive. We are all in business. We are always selling either some idea, or either uh, selling some product, or even selling some emotion, or even selling yourself. But we are always trading something. And, uh, the, the basic of this uh, trader uh, opportunity or uh, trading mission or trading activity is that you have to always think who is the receptor, who, is the, uh, who you are selling that product to. It's, it's just the very basics of, of every single business. It can be a little store, it, it can be a Microsoft, or it can be um, a Petrobras, well, Petrobras, it could be uh, other company, big company, huge company, uh, I'm sorry about that, uh, small company, um, but it's, it's really about selling a product or a service. And this is what I wanted to, to talk about. We, we, we have this uh, financing organization, and the title is Financing Your Organization, right? So we have to think about financing. What is financing? And then we have to think about what is organization, and then what is your, right? Because these are the three words that we have in the title. And then we have to start from the beginning on, on what is what we have, and why is it that we have this idea, and where do we have this idea to go through or to go to, and when. Um, this homeschooling uh, initiative that we have is, is about something. And it's about our children, and it's about our future, and it's about our time in the history, which is, which is now. And then it's about our country. It, those are the factors that we really have to think always. We cannot live without any of those. We are a family that is living in a country, that is living in a time, and is committed to something. And it's also very, very important that we think that we have a commitment with our family and, and, and countries. So we have to start by defining our idea. And what is the size of the project? We may think about a big corporation, but like I said, it's, it's the, same, the same factor. We have to think about a product, and we have to think about a customer. I was uh, reading this, this book about design, and uh, to, to really have something that you could sell. You have to think about an idea, right? But then you may, you may have this idea of a, a skyrocket, right? But in order for you to present that idea, it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be easy because you cannot make a prototype, right? And because you cannot make a prototype, then it is going to be a little bit more difficult to sell that idea. Then you have to share your mind with someone. You really have to think about how to sell your idea. You have to think about how to share uh, your mind with uh, somebody else. I have uh, read about this, this guy that uh, thought about a, a, a palm pilot, right? And a palm pilot, you remember this palm pilot that it was very, uh, last for a very short time? But he had a great idea. But in order for you to implement that idea, you need a lot of engineers, you need a lot of money, you need a lot of support, you need a, a, a huge amount of money. So what he did, he cut a little piece of wood that it was the size of his idea. And then he put it in his pocket. And any time that he was to a meeting, he was acting like if he had that device that he thought about it and he, he actually pull it out and it started just like writing. Just thinking about doing what he thought that can be done. And he used that idea with that little piece of wood there 
for some time, and then that's the way that he made people to be interested in his idea. And he said, what are you doing? Well, I have this idea. And I could do with this, this that I'm doing right now, and, and then really people got very interested. So to have someone to be interested in, someone, in something that you have, you really have to know how to sell that idea, as you were mentioning, to Tracy. We, we really have to think how to do it. There was this other idea. IBM came with this idea that they should have some uh, voice recognition. So to implement this is also very difficult. You really have to think about a lot of software writers and about th this device sensor of, of voice and, and all that. Even to our days, is not very well done. But during that time, what they did is they put this, this, uh, this uh, uh, monitor, and then it says, uh, voice recognition, try it. So they come, and they started saying, hello. And then it appears there, hello. Wow, how are you? And it comes back, how are you? And then, and then it was just a success. But the way that they implemented was the following. There was someone in the back of the, of the, of the, of the wall, and he was listening to what he was saying, and he was just typing what the, the guys were speaking. So this, is the, this was a way to uh, evaluate this potential project. So, and again, what I'm trying to get across is that we have to sell this idea. We have to sell this idea to families. We have to sell this idea to the government. We have to sell this idea to other stakeholders, as uh, Alexei was, was mentioning. It's, it's a task that we have to first really be passionate ourselves about it. We really have to, if we believe in this project, we are going to be able to sell it, but we have to be very uh, strategized to be selling this. So we're not talking about a big corporation, but also when we talk about some other projects, like restaurants or conference or buy a house, everything is about, is about selling or buy a car. But also we have to think about the size of our finance, the size of our project, because where do we get the money from, as Tracy was saying? Uh, we tend to be shy when we have this idea, right? We tend to be that we are a different culture, that Mexico is different, uh, Brazil is different, these Americans, they have a lot of money, these Russians have a lot of castles, these, these Australians have a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, territory, right? And uh, we, we think to th think that we are different, but different in a sense that we, uh, that is more difficult in our country, in our territory to make it. We really have to be very, very emotional about our project because it's about our children and it's about our family. So we, we think where do we get the money, investors, donors, or sponsors, it's everything is about income and out, an outcome and, and about a budget. Um, we have to be accountable. Uh, even if we receive uh, just about uh, two tickets to do something, we have to be accountable. We have to uh, give answers and responses to whoever is supporting something to our cause. And we have to always be careful about how much we receive and how much we, we spend. Um, I just wanted to make uh, uh, or to uh, read a couple of uh, quotes. Um, a couple of them are from someone that you have heard. And it says, if you cannot control your emotions, you cannot control your money. When we talk about emotions, yes, we have to be very passionate about our ideas. But we have to be very careful. Because sometimes our emotions go way ahead of our words. And we tend to be frustrated because we think that nobody understands us. So we have to control our emotions to be clear in our mind. And then another quote that says, someone is sitting in the shade today because someone planted a tree long time ago. These two are from Warren Buffett. And then there is another one that says, for which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down 
and count the cost. And I think you know who is this coming from. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alberto. Uh, next, we're from South Africa. My. Okay, so my presentation is mainly about how we finance our organizations in South Africa. First, the something about myself. Uh, I'm very fortunate to be here. My wife is also here, and we've got five children, which are all homeschooled, except the eldest one attended school for one year while we were getting ready. And he is here, also visiting with us. He's already working, and he paid for his own trip. And we come from Cape Town in South Africa which is very similar to Rio. It's famous for its mountain, its sea, and its soccer stadium. Um, I just want to, so my focus will be on, on financing homeschool associations and a legal defense fund because those organizations are important to what I think is in, in what I call a healthy home education ecosystem. And if you've got such an ecosystem, parents have got the choice what products and services to buy for their children. And they're not dictated by the state what curriculum to use, uh, how to assess their children or anything. So we need those organizations to create a safe environment in which publishers can develop products and parents can choose products. So in a way, if we create a safe home education ecosystem, we're sort of creating a free market within a market that's not very free, where uh, we have regulations, regulates all industries. But if we want to have a healthy home education ecosystem, we need to create our own free market. And for that, we need associations which operate in the political domain and then legal defense funds which operate in the legal domain, in the judi judicial domain. That's a very difficult word. Judicial. So I've got this, the state there that wants to get involved there. Those associations or those organizations are there to keep the state away. So, I've, I'm just looking at the Legal Defense Fund, uh, uh, an example of, of where uh, we get our money from. Um, th the first thing I want to say is uh, we don't have staff attorneys, so we use attorneys as we need them. So our legal expenses will be very little and suddenly there's a big expense and then it's it's very little again so we need a reserve fund to 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 available so we can pay those huge expenses when a court case comes up so that's what we call the insurance model but it seems that the word insurance is not so popular but anyway <laughs> our income is mainly from membership fees so those numbers, uh, you see there's a little uh, Big Mac hamburger there. So because I'm talking to an international audience, I decided to use an international currency, which is the Big Mac, um, <laughs> which is used by the economist. So, um, so in terms of Big Macs, those are the numbers. And you can, <laughs> so a majority of our income is from membership fees. But then you also, because you've, you need this fund, uh, this reserve fund that generates some interest for you. So, uh, and then there are some other sources of income. So, mainly membership, and you got to balance your budget based on your membership fees. You should not re um, be dependent on your interest because you might need to use up your funds for a court case. So, that's basically how the defense fund is, is um, funded. 
And this is the expenses size. There we've got two full-time employees uh, that um, uh, that um, um, use most of the funds. We don't have staff attorneys, so we don't have those expenses. And then, um, and then uh, some estimate of legal expenses, but that thing can vary very much from year to year. So that's mainly our model. Membership fees, income, uh, uh, mainly source of income, and then um, salaries, the main source of expenses. Then the association. So we sitting with a, uh, a number of associations in South Africa, and these are the type of things that they can generate income from, and they do it to more or less extent. So uh, exhibitions we, uh, is the same word that we use for what you lose a conference. You've got speakers, you've got exhibitors, you've got workshops and stuff. The other thing we call there is uh, what I think is a potential source of um, income is what are called school events. Now what often happens in South Africa is that there are major events in the country like a bicycle riding competition or a swimming competition but they're all based on the school system so if you want to enter the competition you must be member of a school otherwise you can't enter they don't cater for an individual homeschooler to to enter so then uh, association can be a type of umbrella so you say okay all of you uh, enter under our name and we sort of act like a school uh, so this has been done in the Western Cape for example there is a, a athletics uh, organization that organizes athletics events and then private schools enter there but now the Western Cape home educators have also entered as a school there and they can then can collect the funds on behalf of the homeschoolers and pay it over to the organization that uh, offers the event. So that's a, a source of income that I think we can develop there. Discount schemes is the same type of thing as I had an, a thing, um, Adobe <coughs> offers huge discounts to buy some expensive package, uh, I think a desktop publishing package and if you can show that you are attending a school or that you're a pupil at a school, then you can get this discount. But they don't cater for the homeschoolers. Then again, uh, an association can say, listen, here's a letter that says you're a homeschooler, and then you can get the discount. So those are the type of things that we are currently exploring for associations to, to generate income. And the, the other thing, this is my, this is what we do as a family, family. we run a, a website. So um, there are lots of publishers and curriculum suppliers that have got products. And there are lots of parents over here. But those publishers struggle to get to the target market. Um, because homeschoolers are spread all over the country. They are not members of a specific organization. There's not a single database of them. So um, we started this independent website. We're not r linked to any um, curriculum or educational approach. We just provide information on homeschooling, and we then provide a facility for curriculum suppliers to advertise. And what we're also busy with is also to provide a facility for those people to sell their products online for small little curriculum supplies they don't have the capacity to to build that technology so that's also um, some kind of income we busy generating and that's uh, my story thank you very much okay our
our last presenter is uh, Paul from Canada, uh, and he'll uh, wrap this up, and then we'll open up for questions. Thanks, Ray. Uh, great, uh, great comments so far, which I would just repeat and echo. I'm not going to go through the same stuff, but try to fill in a few uh, things that I think are worth hearing, and then go very quickly to questions for, for the stuff you guys are thinking about. The Canadian model started off with the legal defense sort of model, which is essentially you sell a suite of services primarily, uh, or the primary one is legal defense for families for a membership fee. That brings in a certain amount of finances in return for certain obligations and expenses. What we've been adding to that more recently in increasing amounts is donations, for, uh, voluntary donations from individuals. And we actually use both of those models, which is the same as HSLDA in the States, and have found there to be a real synergy there because what you find is people will give money for different reasons. So the membership model is really everyone pays the same amount for a suite of services, but some people will really like what you're doing. And we have some very loyal members who have paid that membership amount, but really believe in what we're doing and have the ability to give more money than that. But the membership model doesn't capture that additional loyalty, if you will. Uh, the flip side to that is the donation model requires, um, well, you're asking people to give a lot of money usually, but you don't get the breadth of representation. So you don't get as many people involved in your organization. And there are consequences to that, like not having, um, well, really families to speak to their elected representatives. You can't, when you speak to elected representatives, you can't say you represent as many people. So between the two models, you really increase your strength by having both. That's what I think we've found. Uh, going into the uh, raising money, asking people for money, I have found for myself, because this is something I've had to learn, and there's a whole science to it. Th this is a skill that can be developed, asking people for money, um, professional begging, <laughs> if you will. Um, but there's a science to it, and I think I probably speak for all the speakers in this session and other ones. This is a taster. This is some basic information. If we can help you in any way, get in touch with us. I'll give my card to anyone who wants it. Happy to help going forward. But there's a science to asking for money. But what I've found to be the biggest part of that is having the correct understanding of it. So we actually aren't professional beggars. <laughs> that is not the right attitude to have. You won't raise a lot of money if you think of yourself as a professional beggar. What, what we're doing when we ask for money is you really are discovering an opportunity. So you're seeing there is a need in our country to serve a group of individuals who can't serve themselves or to do a thing that cannot be done by selling it. There's this great need out there and by meeting that need, we can accomplish some great goal. And so you really develop a vision for how you can do a great good. People like to be part of that. In the human heart, I don't care which country you're from, is the desire to do good, to benefit our fellow human beings, to respond to needs. And if you can develop a strong, passionate vision for how to do that, then you can share that with other people and say, look, we've got this plan to help all these families or to transform the lives of these children through education or to accomplish whatever is your goal. You can share that with people and then you invite them to be a partner with you in accomplishing that goal. And so you're not, you're not just asking for money, you're giving them the opportunity to be a part of something great. And people respond to that and want to be a part of it. And there's, there's a whole 
science to how you communicate that in maintaining communications and thanking people properly and and building relationships and all that stuff and you know we could take that in the questions but that's essentially the model of asking asking for money so um, I think I'll just stop there and, and open it up to questions and we can talk about whatever people want to okay if I could ask the panelists to come back up and I'll move the mic around to anybody who has a question Yes, I've got a, a question to, it's, it's Bauer, is, is, that, is that correct, Bauer? Yeah, that's, that's good enough. Uh, how do you, because you don't have staff attorneys, um, how do you choose the people that you're doing and ensure that they have the skill set uh, that is required? Uh, because it's a specialist field in the, in the homeschooling. Uh, Mark, with, uh, with, with lawyers and attorneys? That, uh, that is usually done by Leander, so I think he can answer that question better. But um, how do you choose attorneys? Hmm? Uh, it depends on the, on the case. Uh, in the first place, I think it's very important to use attorneys and advocates uh, from the court district where the family lives and where the in event or the incident is, is happening, if one has the right people there. Because um, those people know the courts, they know the judges, they, uh, uh, they know how to uh, put their arguments and so on and so forth. But um, what happens also is uh, sometimes you will have a situation where there just is nobody in that court area who uh, really has the kind of legal uh, specialist knowledge that you need for that particular case. Um, and you might have to bring in somebody from a different city or something like that. Um, but then the other aspect also is uh, in South Africa we have uh, different levels of legal representation. You have an attorney and then you have advocates and then you have senior advocates, uh, the kind of thing that in England would be called Queen's Counsel. Um, now, the attorneys ask reasonable prices. Uh, the senior advocates ask completely unreasonable prices. But very often, they are the ones who will get you the um, uh, what you need for one reason being that because they are very senior lawyers they often um, uh, deputize as judges uh, and they in other words they really move amongst uh, in the in the circle of the judges and they know how to arrange their case in order to persuade their colleagues. Uh, so sometimes it is uh, necessary and valuable to, to, to pay those, those huge prices. Um, so it, it depends. It's, it's, uh, it's a very uh, um, fluid kind of situation. The other thing I need to add is we're using sort of a, a local uh, lawyer or attorney, but then we, since that attorney is not trained in educational law, we have to educate that lawyer a lot and we have to provide a lot of consulting to that one. So we can't just appoint him and he goes on on his own. So there's a lot of consulting to be done by the Pestalozzi Trust before the case starts. 
Thank you. Do you see any kind of uh, profile of a parent who becomes a member? Because uh, I suppose that most of the parents uh, don't. Uh, so maybe do you have any observation on on this? So what parents should uh, come through uh, or should uh, hear or, or read to, 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 to be enough uh, motivated to become a member? So um, that's going to depend a bit on different countries. And it's really a matter of doing your own market research and understanding your own homeschooling community. So we know in different provinces what the homeschooling community is made up of. Um, when legal advocacy is your main model, you get the most members where there's the most problems. So the provinces that have the most legal problems, we have maybe 50% membership. The provinces where it's the least legal problems, we have maybe 10% membership. Uh, but then it depends also on the traditions of how homeschooling started in that area and how they view the collective, um, what other associations they are and whether you have good relationships with them. It's, it's really a matter of really analyzing and understanding the homeschooling community and then knowing how to serve them in a way that they recognize that you're serving them. So. Other members of the panel, do you want to add to that? Go ahead. Yes, th thank you. We are uh, in Mexico going through the process of uh, uh, starting the whole association. We don't have an association. We have uh, different groups that are working uh, independently. And uh, we, we are going through the task of, uh, of speaking with all of the different leaders. Uh, and I think that's uh, what I was trying to refer to selling the product because uh, to really uh, uh, communicate the right message to all of the different leaders so that we can all come out with this uh, uh, common idea. And based on that, we will try to define uh, the profile, which is pretty much families that are home educating their children. I'll just add one other comment. In, in the U.S., with the many different organizations, some of them the membership fee is as low as $25. Others, it's hundreds of dollars, and it varies based on services. So based upon the level of services, you may have a very broad membership fee, but very few services. So that, that's another um, consideration. We have time for one more question before lunch. Anyone else? Uh, not a question, but I can add to the uh, um, response to the question about profile. We find the where the Pestalozzi Trust is concerned, which is a legal defense fund. Um, I would say that the, uh, the majority of our members are responsible homeschoolers who understand the need for a legal advocacy organization and who support that and who are glad in, uh, in, in return for the peace of mind that they get to know that there's somebody to back them up in case they get into conflict with the authorities. Um, and it does make a major difference to a mother at home alone with her children while father is out getting the bacon to know that there is a number that she will call and that number will ring even in Brazil. Uh, <laughs> um, there's another category. Um, uh, these are people who are really just scared. They're not very much uh, concerned about uh, contributing to the homeschooling community in general. So it's more about their own uh, um, concerns. And then there are people who uh, know that they're going to get into conflict, who have been homeschooling for many years and uh, never joined and then suddenly they start seeing uh, dark clouds on the horizon and they suddenly want to join. So <laughs> we have to have a clause that 
we will assist all our members, but only with issues that arose after they joined the Legal Defense Fund. Okay. Um, incidentally, my wife had to make a phone call one time because of someone knocking at the door. It, is, it was a great relief when uh, we knew that we had HSLDA membership to help us. Well, it's lunchtime. I was asked to remind everyone that if you do not have a lunch ticket, you need to pick one up. They will not let you eat downstairs unless you have one and you can get one at the registration desk right outside. Um, we start up again at one o'clock and thank you once again panel.